All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started so we can let you guys go about your day. We know that you're doing a lot of Zoom meetings um, in this point in time. Uh, hopefully some of you are um, being safe back at work if you have to go back or working nicely from home. So um, my name is Brandon Rounds and I am the Partnerships and Events Manager here at the Fitchburg Chamber. Um, we are doing this lovely uh, Zoom professional development for all of our members and those and beyond called Marketing Mission. Uh, Marketing Mission is um, a way for us to connect you with industry professionals across all marketing uh, platforms. Uh, share real-time tools and tips to effectively market your business and your personal and professional brands. Uh, so this month, we are very excited to have uh, Dusty here from PodCamp Media. He's the owner and founder. Uh, uh, his little bio here says, in the, way, in the same way that Netflix changed the way we watch television, podcasts are, ex are exploding in popularity. This has created a massive opportunity for brands, companies, and associations to engage with customers and members and build brand equity that produces results. PodCamp Pod Media is a Wisconsin-based startup creative agency specializing in the production of high-quality podcasts for corporate clients who want to incorporate on-demand audio into their communication strategies. It was founded by Dusty here. Uh, he's a UW-Madison alumnus who worked for more than 15 years in a variety of media, public relations, and content marketing roles prior to the company's uh, 2019 launch. His career has uh, included work as a correspondent for CBS Radio Network, a reporter and anchor for WIODAM in Miami, Florida. Bet you're glad to be here right now and not in Florida. Always, always <laughs> glad to be out of Florida. <laughs> Public Relations Supervisor at Milwaukee City Hall and Strategic Communications Manager for the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, one of the world's leading trade associations. In this presentation, Dusty will outline the benefits of podcasting, demonstrate the steps that go into producing a podcast, and discuss the finer points of podcast strategy. Um, I did want to also say that on August 27th, we have our next Fitch for Focus, um, and on September 8th is our next marketing mission, and we will be talking about Facebook Live and what's how to, just how to do live on your Facebook for your business. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Dusty. Brandon, thank you very much for the introduction Absolutely. and thank you for having me as well. I have to say that the city of Fitchburg holds a special place in my heart. Uh, I lived in the Madison area for about eight years and uh, spent a fair amount of time during those eight years uh, hacking pieces out of the Nine Springs golf course just off of mm -hmm. Fish Hatchery Road. Because I was such a bad golfer, it was the only place that would actually let me on. Um, but uh, we did enjoy ourselves uh, significantly out there. And I love the Madison area. I still have family in the area and get back. Uh, these days, I call the Milwaukee area home. Um, as uh, Brandon mentioned, there was a brief period in there where I uh, uh, called Miami, Florida home as well. One of these things is not like the others, as they say. Um, but excited to uh, be here and uh, talking about uh, podcasts and how podcasting can be incorporated into the marketing strategy for your business. Um, so just a, a, a quick overview here of uh, what podcasting can do for your business. And when I talk about this, I talk about it from the perspective of someone who has uh, launched and run a business now for about the past year and really only used podcasting and a little bit of social media as well as a means of promoting my own business. So these are strategies that have worked for me as well. Um, but podcasting allows you as a business leader to promote your business or promote people within your organization as thought leaders in their fields, uh, to share your expertise with the world and, and make yourself an authority uh, in whatever your field happens to be. It also opens up a window to engage with your customers or your members, if you have paying members of whatever your organization it is, and provide them with good brand value and to really allow them to associate you, again, with being a leader in that field. Podcasting is a very potent form of content marketing, if you're familiar with the notion of content marketing. If not, we're going to get into that too a little bit in uh, the course of this. 
Um, also spreads awareness as awareness of your podcast spreads. So too does awareness of your brand. And in the course of that, you're going to generate new leads. More people are going to be interested in the services that you offer. But, and this last point here is possibly the most potent aspect of podcasting as a brand strategy. You create a pretext if you're in the B2B business to business aspect uh, of, uh, of sales, you create a pretext for interacting with other brands that could potentially become your customers. And you see the picture here of uh, me with this very charming group of people. Those are my clients at the National Corn Growers Association. Uh, we were recording a podcast at their St. Louis headquarters there, along with Adam Collins, that fellow over there on the right, who is the uh, chief communications officer at what was then called Miller Coors, now called Molson Coors. Um, the second largest brewer in the United States. And uh, the way that I landed the National Corn Growers Association as a client uh, was I reached out to their vice president of communications originally, not seeking to add them as a client, but to have them on my podcast to talk about a story of theirs that I thought was very interesting. Um, that started a relationship and allowed us down the line to sign them on as clients and uh, they're now one of uh, the leading podcasts in my portfolio that we run here out of PodCamp Media. So it's just a really cool story, but it all started with that B2B interaction of, hey, Neil, you're an expert in this thing that I want to talk about on my podcast. Come be on my show. A couple key takeaways for you here in the presentation um, in this really weird and awful time of COVID-19, uh, podcasting is a means of marketing that is social distancing friendly. Uh, you can do the entire episode production and distribution and consumption process without ever having to go face to face with somebody. Um, someday, uh, hopefully, COVID-19 is going to be locked down under control and we can go back to recording podcasts in person. Um, but the virtual recording process is just as potent just as effective. And if you do it right, the sound quality is just as good, if not better than actually recording in person. Um, podcast listenership is exploding. Uh, Brandon mentioned in his intro that uh, we're seeing the Netflixification of the audio programming medium now as well. Um, but people want to watch their programs or listen to their programs from beginning to the end on their own schedule. They don't want to have to deal with somebody else's schedule and they want to be able to pause it and step away for a minute too. Um, a lot of people in the podcasting space will tell you that the key to being a successful podcaster is just to pump out as much content as humanly possible and not really give a hoot about how good it sounds. I cut against the grain there. I insist that quality, not quantity, is going to define the successful podcast uh, in, uh, in, the, in the next decade. Uh, quantity over quality is sort of the old school method that uh, I don't think there's a space for anymore. There are more than a million podcasts out there that are active right now. And so you've got to make yours sound good if you want to stand above the competition there. And then finally, like all good content marketing, if you're using podcasting as a method of marketing your business, you can't just talk about what your business does for 30 minutes. That's called an infomercial and people hate those. Good content marketing informs and entertains your customers. It's not about selling. The selling comes later. This is at the top of the sales funnel where you're just trying to build awareness and get people excited about your brand. You close the deal later. Inform and entertain. So a little bit about my background and why you should give two hoots about what I think about podcasts at all. Uh, first and foremost, this is where I got my start as an audio programming producer. Uh, this is the pastoral back door uh, at the radio station in Monroe, Wisconsin, about 35 miles down the road from Fitchburg. That's where I grew up, and that's where I got my first job in traditional radio back in the day. Uh, we called it the chalet in the valley, but really it was more of a shack and a cornfield. W-E-K-Z in Monroe, Wisconsin, where I was hired at the ripe old age of 17 years old to come in after school and help run soundboards and mix programming. After a few months there, uh, there was an overnight air shift that opened up and, and they let me go on the air and it's been all downhill ever since then for me. Uh, but I got radio, I got microphones in the blood from an early age and uh, uh, just discovered it was something that I really loved doing. And uh, 
I've been doing it ever since. I worked there on and off for about three years, but I also went to school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and got involved with the student radio station there, 91.7 FM WSUM. You might recognize those call letters if you ever surf the FM dial in Madison. It's a wonderful learning opportunity for people, uh, for young people that are uh, coming up. My radio show at WSUM uh, was a blatant ripoff of The Daily Show with John Stewart, and we had a lot of fun doing it. In fact, we had so much fun. Uh, we got featured in the Wisconsin State Journal once upon a time, um, and uh, we went on to win an award for being the best college radio show in the nation, according to College Broadcasting Incorporated, in 2007. And uh, in case you think that that picture that they chose to run of me in the State Journal is the least flattering picture they possibly could have run of me, you would in fact be completely wrong, because this is the least flattering picture ever taken of me. This was the uh, this was the poster that we flyered all over the UW campus uh, when we were doing this radio show. And I'll flip to the next slide so you don't have to look at it anymore. But we had a lot of fun. Uh, we certainly channeled the, uh, the spirit of the onion, uh, another institution that called Madison home, and, uh, and just had a lot of fun doing that radio show. After I graduated, I spent a little bit of time working in a, a newspaper environment in Portage, Wisconsin, before I came right back to Madison and took a job as a reporter and news anchor at Madison 1670 WTDY. That's a radio station that was a news talk leader in the Madison area, uh, home to such local airwave celebrities as Sly and Tim Morrissey, Glenn Gardner and the like. Um, it's also, uh, like a lot of radio stations, uh, one that's not on the dial anymore. But uh, during my time there, I got sent off to the Rose Bowl to cover the Badgers when they went there. J.J. Watt's last game as a Badger. I was on the field for it. Um, I also uh, spent a lot of time in 2011 down at the state capitol. I don't have to tell any of you guys that that was a big time down there, but there's me uh, having a little interview with uh, former Senator Russ Feingold in the middle of all the pandemonium down at the state capitol in 2011. Um, also during that time, I became a correspondent for the CBS radio network because there was a lot of national interest in what was happening at our Wisconsin state capitol. And that got me called up to the big leagues, as they say, where I went off to Miami, Florida and took a uh, reporter news anchor job at news radio 610 WIOD, the wonderful Isle of dreams, as we called it back then. Um, uh, got to cover some really pivotal interesting stories there, including uh, the Miami Heat's uh, uh, title win. I was uh, on the court for that. I uh, got to interview LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh and the big three when they won their title in 2012. Uh, I was also a frontline reporter nationally on the uh, shooting death of a young man named Trayvon Martin, a story that uh, continues to resonate today. Um, I wanted to get back to Wisconsin, though, Miami and, and Florida in general, not my idea of a great time. Uh, so uh, I also wanted to pivot to uh, a slightly less demanding uh, uh, career and so accepted a job at Milwaukee City Hall as a public relations specialist, but also hosting some programming on Milwaukee's uh, uh, government access TV channel. Spent five years working at Milwaukee City Hall and in politics in general. Before I took a job with the Association of Equipment Manufacturers, one of the largest trade associations in the world, representing a thousand companies across North America that build heavy construction and agriculture equipment. Um, it was during this time that uh, I was asked to oversee a content marketing initiative for AEM uh, designed to get its members excited about new and emerging technologies. And one of the facets that I built into that content marketing initiative, based on my background as a, an audio content producer, was the AEM Thinking Forward podcast. This is something that we did entirely in-house. I had a lot of fun doing it. And then something completely unexpected happened. It blew up and uh, became sort of an industry thought leader uh, in the heavy equipment space. It got so popular that uh, people started ringing my phone and asking me, how do you make a podcast for a, a business like AEM? And uh, that got the wheels turning and, and me, who's never had an entrepreneurial bone in my body, uh, I decided to uh, launch my own company uh, a year ago, signed AEM as my first client. And uh, since then, it's been all about uh, growing this business and, uh, and finding new and interesting clients to help tell their story through podcasting. So this is a little example of uh, what we did on the AEM Thinking Forward podcast. Virtual reality 
is really just a better way to train. It does elicit not only an emotional, but a biological response. And those are the things that form memories, and you can't let go of it. Always face the total track. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> This is like a fun house with the stairs here. Jeepers. This is the best fell over. Even as he's reminding me to face the flow of traffic, I look away for just a second to place a virtual cone, and a passing motorist swerves and might have taken some of the leather off my belt if this was the real world. If I'm a new construction worker and this is part of my first day orientation, I slip on this virtual reality headset, and what do I see? What do I do? Yeah, you are immediately dropped into a virtual world. So it looks, it sounds, it feels like you're on the side of a four-lane highway on a paving train. And if you've never been in that situation before, and a lot of our new workers, new laborers have not, it's, it can be a very shocking experience. I can it's imagine very that's a little bit intimidating. Yeah, with traffic rushing by. Yeah, and that's the point. That's where the emotional response comes in. So you meet with your foreman. Your foreman then introduces you to the rest of the crew. He sets the expectations for the day and what he expects of you when it comes to safety. And he gives you some hints of things that you need to remember for later on in the day. And if you don't, there's going to be memorable consequences. That sounds like what we like to call foreshadowing in the entertainment business. Yes, so you better be paying attention. I am supposed to walk right between this dump truck and the MTV, which I bet it's going to be one of these things where I just got to keep my head on a swivel. So let's go over to Abby and take her this shovel. Yep, there it goes. Faulty backup alarm and my own impatience get me this time. But then I get to start the scenario over. In real life, you don't get a second try. You should walk, right? That's just a little example of uh, uh, what we did on the AEM Thinking Forward podcast and, uh, and some of the fun that we had there. Um, now mind you, that's an example of a video promo of the episode. The episode itself did not feature video throughout the entire thing. It was audio only. But in order to promote it on social media, we put together these videos that people can share on their social media channels and, and sort of whet people's appetite a little bit for the full podcast episode, hopefully enticing them to click in and listening. So what's so great about podcasting anyway? Why, why is this a, a space that you should invest your hard-earned marketing dollars or at least your time and labor? Well, I was at, back when we got to go to conferences in person, about a year ago, I went to the world's largest podcasting conference, the podcast movement. Um, and uh, one of the keynote speakers was Guy Raz. He's uh, an NPR guy, host of uh, some of the world's most successful podcasts, including How I Built This, the TED Radio Hour. Uh, he said this, which was really compelling to me at the time. He'd prefer to have 5,000 podcast listeners over 100,000 Twitter followers any day. And his reasoning is that like when you run for president, you need 5 million people to slap a bumper sticker on your car and 50,000 people to get out and be your door knockers. Podcast listeners, those are your door knockers. Those are your brand evangelists, the people that are going to shout about you from the mountaintops, share your episodes and your content with all the friends and family and colleagues, and just generally be very highly engaged with your company. And so if we look at podcast listening trends over the uh, past decade and a half here, uh, this is uh, all data from Edison Research. They've been tracking podcast listenership since podcasts were basically invented. And what you see here is that 51% uh, and estimated 144 million Americans have ever listened to a podcast. This is a number that grows year in and year out. When you look at people who consider themselves to be monthly podcast listeners, this is a number that has almost doubled in just the last five years. When you look at people who consider themselves to be weekly podcast listeners, this is a number that has almost doubled in just the last four years. Um, we see this uh, uh, this this uh, trend growing across all age demographics. Certainly young people tend to be attracted to podcasts more than people in that 55 plus demographic, but everybody's discovering it at this point. And for a lot of the same reason that Netflix and Hulu have really changed the way that we watch TV. Again, you want your pot programming to begin when you at the beginning and end at the end. You want to be able to pause it and listen at your own convenience. Among weekly podcast listeners, the average number of podcasts they listen to in a given week is seven. 
uh, which is about uh, three and a half to seven hours of podcast programming. When you figure that the average podcast runs about a half hour to an hour, people love listening mostly because you can multitask. You can take it with you wherever you go. And it's just a great way to learn on the fly. And so we see this reflected in where people listen to podcasts. The home is the main place people listen, but also in their car, truck, on their commute, while they're out walking the dog and while they are at the gym or working out. And so I tell folks, if you're making a podcast, you want it to run about as long as the average workout. About a half hour to 45 minutes is really the sweet spot. This is my favorite slide in the entire deck because it's wild. When Edison asked monthly podcast listeners how much of a typical, typical episode they listen to, 93% said they listen to the entire podcast or most of a podcast, which is insane because attention spans are shorter than they've ever been. The average consumer engages with a typical piece of Facebook content for less than two seconds. Most people abandon a website if it takes more than three seconds to load. When people are watching YouTube videos, videos that they want to be watching, not ads, but the actual content they went to find, they still lose interest after about two and a half minutes. And somehow in podcasting, we get their undivided attention for 45 minutes at a time. And so we've seen a lot of brands move into this space. Uh, McDonald's, GE, eBay, Blue Apron, Trader Joe's has a podcast for some reason. I haven't listened to that one. I'm not terribly interested in it, but I'm interested in what they're talking about. And even REI has a great branded podcast. And so um, this is uh, another example of uh, a podcast that I run. These are my clients at the National Corn Growers Association. And this is the preview that we did to promote their podcast when it went live earlier this year. There's a conversation happening about the future of farming in America, and some folks feel like their voices aren't being heard. But this is our way of life, and that's the heart of what makes America strong. I'm John Doggett. I'm the CEO of the National Corn Growers Association, and I travel all over this great nation of ours working to protect that way of life. And now I'm inviting you to join in on this conversation about the future. My new podcast will take you with me as I talk with those who are shaping the future of agriculture. From the fields of the Corn Belt to the D.C. Beltway, we'll make sure that the growers who feed America have a say in the issues that are important to them. So subscribe now to Wherever John May Roam, the National Corn Growers Association podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Our first episodes are going to come out on January the 22nd, and we're going to have new episodes every month. You can listen from your truck, your tractor, your combine, wherever else is convenient. So stay tuned to the issues that are important to you and join me, John Doggett, wherever John may roam from the National Corn Growers Association. Man, if that isn't an injection of meat and potatoes directly into the bloodstream, I don't know what is. But the NCGA, the National Corn Growers Association, is doing a great job with their branded podcast because they're not just talking about growing corn all the time. They're talking about these big picture topics that are tangentially related to it, but actually just really broadening the horizons of these people who are their members. Uh, they're talking about international trade. They're talking about inner city agriculture and poverty and how those are tied together and food deserts. They're talking about all of these big picture ideas that, uh, uh, that just do a great job of activating and, and uh, enticing the attention of their members. So five quick rules for effective content marketing uh, uh, with uh, using podcasting here. And, and these are the rules that I lay down for every single client that I bring on board here. But the first rule, number one, is to tell a compelling story. And this gets back to this drum that you're going to hear me bang again and again and again. Do not just describe your products and services. If you're doing that, it's an infomercial and those are terrible. Instead, you want to provide some sort of value to your listeners. And so this is a, a, a branded podcast that I actually listen to myself. Uh, REI, the outdoors uh, equipment uh, company, um, they have a great podcast and it's not about the tents and boots and backpacks that they sell. It's about people going out into nature and hiking up mountains and fighting grizzly bears and whitewater rafting and all that kind of stuff. The great stories that happen in the outdoors. Um, and, and mind you, while they're out there, they're using tents and backpacks and boots and they got them at REI, but that's not the point of the podcast. The podcast is about telling these really compelling stories 
of people going out and uh, doing things. And that's interesting to me because I identify with that. I like to think of myself as a rugged outdoorsman too. Uh, my wife might dispute that a little bit, but I like to think I could fight a grizzly bear. And so listening to this podcast for me is a, a great way to hear stories about other people doing that. Rule number two, and this is kind of hand in hand with rule number one there, is to do something original. As I mentioned earlier, there are a million active podcasts out there right now. So if, uh, if you're a realtor and you want to do a realty podcast uh, where you go out and, uh, and talk about market conditions and, and what it means, you should be advised that there are several thousand other podcasts out there that do that already. And if you're retreading old ground, uh, you're essentially going up against and competing against these people that have been doing it longer than you have and have already built up a base of listeners. And so you want to tack an original course uh, for what you're going to do. Find what sets your brand apart and celebrate that. Rule number three, and this might be the most important among them, I should probably move it to rule number one, but you need to define your niche before you get before you even produce your first episode, you want to know who your listener is. Determine who that target listener is and then speak to them in a language that nobody else speaks to them to, and you will develop a rabid following. Mass appeal is not the objective with a podcast. You want to have that niche appeal. And so the example that I have here is an entire subgenre of podcasts that makes no sense to me personally. Woodworking podcasts are insanely popular. Uh, I have a buddy who's a, a woodworker and he just spends all afternoon in his shop working on whatever project he has going on and listening to these podcasts. And he does that because these are the only people who get him. The rest of, uh, the, rest of the guys at Poker Night that hang out together with him, we don't, we don't get what's so excited about wood, exciting about woodworking, but the rest of the people uh, in these podcasts do. And so he finds his niche there. You want to define your niche and speak to that niche. Rule number four is your podcast needs to sound professional and polished. Uh, if you're a high value brand, you need to be on level with NPR or better. Because again, there's a million other podcasts out there. You need to stand above. Early in the history of podcasting, it was okay to sound like you were recorded in a basement. Uh, but nowadays, you at least have to make the effort. Otherwise, you come across, especially when you're a brand in the podcasting space, you come across as cheap and unprofessional. And, and those are words that you never want associated with your brand. Finally, this rule uh, is that you just you have to be patient uh, with a podcast. You don't put an episode out and then log on the next day and see how many people have listened because that's going to depress you a little bit. Podcasting is an investment of time and patience. Uh, I recently interviewed for my podcast a fellow by the name of Joe Polizzi. Uh, he's referred to as the godfather of content marketing. He even invented the term. And he says that you don't even want to judge the success or failure of your podcast until it's been around for bare minimum 12, preferably 18 months. And that's how much time it takes uh, to properly promote and entice a listenership and build a subscriber base. Remember, you're building fans, not customers right off the bat. And so all those rules are rules that I used to create a podcast that I used to promote my brand, a show by the name of Lead Balloon. And I did this by sitting down and thinking to myself, okay, what's an original take that I can do on marketing and public relations? There are a million podcasts out there about marketing and public relations best practices. So many so that it's become almost like a bad joke. And so I thought to myself, my audience is going to be public relations and marketing practitioners. Those people love getting together over drinks and telling old war stories about times that they were in a really tight professional situation and they figured it out and they got out of it through being clever or something like that. So, Lead Balloon is this. It was like a slow motion car accident. And I was like saying to myself, oh no, this isn't happening. This doesn't read like the normal FBI press release. You know, swung around my chair, looked at my boss, David. He goes, yeah, I don't think we're supposed to have this. We were just shocked and didn't know what to do, hoping that we still got the shot. <laughs> he looked at the face. 
none of us. We're ready to do battle with a multinational big deer behemoth. Holy cow, that thing you did, you stepped in it. Had you walked in half of the other offices here, you'd be walking out with your pink paper right now here today. You want to communicate to them. You want to tell them what you are doing as a company to protect them. McDonald's is one of the most fiercely protective companies of their own brand. I think the other media companies, if they would have been financially sound, would have picked up on it. This is a field that draws in creative people and sometimes chews them up and spits them out. I'm Dusty Weiss from PodCamp Media, and we'll rehash those stories because sometimes there are valuable lessons to be learned. And sometimes it just feels good to hear about someone else's disaster. You could be having a crisis and a catastrophe behind the scenes, but as long as it all stays behind the curtain, that's, that's what you want. So that podcast right there has basically been the sole vehicle that I've used to promote my business, that and social media. And, uh, and so far it's worked wonders for me. The buzz has been fantastic. The inquiries have been really encouraging and people generally seem to like listening to it. And, and they reach out to me and they say, uh, not necessarily, oh, I was really interested in the technical prowess that you displayed in, in having this podcast, more that you seem like someone that knows what you're talking about and we like you as a person. We think we can do business with you. And that's just another one of the, uh, uh, the powers of uh, podcasting as a form of content marketing here. Um, so I want to take you briefly through some of the steps that go into making a podcast. Um, and as I told Brandon, I totally would. We're uh, going to run... Uh, right up against the clock here. So I'm going to run through this kind of fast. Um, if you have more questions about this, feel free to ask them to Brandon and uh, I can elaborate a little bit in the Q&A segment here or else feel free to email me and, and I can fill in any of the blanks that you have after listening to this. There are five basic steps that go into making a podcast. And uh, they're outlined right here. Each one has a whole bunch of smaller steps that uh, constitute it. Um, but the first step is sort of the planning and strategy phase where you just sit down before you buy a microphone, before you record any tape, and just define what are your objectives? Who's your target audience? How are you going to brand it? What format is the show going to take? What's the cadence? Or how often is the show going to come out? Weekly? Monthly? What do you have time for? What can you afford? Who are you going to have as podcast guests? All of those are questions that you need to answer well before you ever think about getting into these four steps here. And then the last four steps in this process are steps then that happen on your cadence. So if it's a monthly podcast, you're doing this every month. If it's a weekly podcast, you better have some free time on your hands because uh, it is a grind. Um, but uh, we can kind of go through these uh, one by one. So again, the planning and strategy is the first step, and, and that's really what goes into that. Um, you need to answer some uh, uh, very specific questions, and you need to define, as I said, define your niche, define who your listener is to an almost uncomfortable degree of specificity right there. Um, Pre-production is the uh, next step right here uh, where you're reaching out to your guests, you're getting them scheduled on the calendar, uh, you're making arrangements to have them, you're writing scripts, outlining topics, um, prepping your guests, sending them a microphone if they need it because again, quality is job number one, not quantity, uh, setting up to do the record and, uh, and then of course checking your equipment to make sure that it's all set up. Um, Step three is the recording process itself. Uh, this is uh, uh, an important step in the process. It's also the quickest. It's over and done uh, very quick. And so you don't have a lot of, uh, not a lot of room for error there. Um, but uh, in addition to all of these steps here, uh, are you going to take video of it to use in social media later? Are you going to live stream your recording session on Facebook? Facebook or LinkedIn or any other platform right there, because that can be a great way to promote your podcast as well. And then this is, to me, this is the most important step here. This is also the most labor intensive part of the process. Post-production, editing, fine tuning, uh, mixing, um, adding any music that you want, uh, doing a final mix down, uh, producing a transcript or written transcript of the podcast to accompany it on your website, because that is great for so, uh, search engine optimization or SEO and uh, all of that. Um, but also editing, I just say in general is an important step in the process. 
um, because it makes you sound more professional. And and this right here is an example of of how that works. Hey, uh, this is uh, something that I uh, uh, recently did for a client just to Media. demonstrate just how to the editing a works. Moment here to uh, fast forward a little bit. Demonstrate here. for you the power of editing. Can. I can't. Uh, a little peek behind the curtain of uh, what I do with every single podcast episode that we put together. Uh, so if you take a look here, uh, you've got an example from the most recent episode of the SWIB podcast. This is David Villa speaking. And uh, I'm going to highlight uh, this clip right here, uh, the part that I'm going to play you. It runs about one minute uh, over the course of this clip. And what you see here on the yellow track, this is the edited version. So every single one of these white and black lines that you see run vertically through this yellow track is an edit that I made. Across the course of the one minute clip, there are about 30 of them. That means that I'm making about one undetectable edit every two seconds or so. Now, this is a pretty extreme example. David is, is of course, a very intelligent, very well-spoken person, but he tends to take his time to compose his thoughts. And so there are a lot of really long pauses in the way that he speaks. Um, and in an audio only medium, that can kind of wear on your listeners, wear them out a little bit. And so I haven't really changed the body of what he says at all. I've just helped him say it in a more compelling manner. And so I'll give you an example of how this works here. First, I'm going to play for you a uh, clip of the before. This is the raw audio of David speaking and, and how it sounded before we edited it. It's often associated with, with the debt cycle or the credit cycle. This was different because it was more like a natural disaster. And so what you hear here, so this was caused more by um, there's an a um, force of nature, like a hurricane or an earthquake. And a lot of long pauses. A volcano. So it's a it's not necessarily and there he repeated it a and then restarted variable. his sentence that um that um long pause uh, lip smack imploded it was a another long a virus pause. a pandemic uh that led to social distancing and the social distancing uh did great great damage to the global economy here's a really long pause i think underneath that is um this is not a black swan. This is not something that is uh, happening for the first time in history. Um, this was easily anticipated. And so what and we're I able to do that, uh, through editing here is essentially clean up a lot of that dead space, the uhs, the ums, uh, the parts where he restarts his sentence. We're able to do that in a manner that is undetectable but makes it just a lot easier to listen to. And so here's an example of how that winds up sounding after I'm done with it. And each time you see this red line cross one of these white and black lines, that's an edit that you're hearing. It's often associated with the debt cycle or the credit cycle. This was different because it was more like a natural disaster. This was caused more by a force of nature, like a hurricane or an earthquake. So, so as you see, it's not these necessarily are undetectable, a market but variable edit, that imploded. Edit. It was a edit. virus, a pandemic uh, that led to social distancing, and the social distancing edit. did great, great damage to edit. the global economy. This edit. is not a black swan. Edit. This is not something that edit. is uh, happening for the first time in history. Edit. This was edit. easily anticipated. Edit. And we're done. And what you see there is the end result is what was originally one minute of audio. Uh, we got across to the listener in 35 seconds there. So the way that I look at that is we're taking your listeners and giving them 25 seconds of their lives back. Uh, you wind up with a product that's much more palatable. It's a lot easier to listen to. Again, David is an incredibly intelligent person. So I'll stop that there. But again, editing is key to producing a, a professional sounding podcast um, because using it properly, you can make anybody sound like a professional orator and it just makes your podcast easier to listen to. If somebody tunes into your podcast and it's painful to listen to, they're not ever going to come back. It's like going to a party and getting, going to, going to a, a buffet and getting food poisoning there. You're, you're not really inclined to visit ever again. 
And the final step here is the distribution of the podcast. That's putting it out on the web, making it available to listeners through their favorite podcast app, uh, sending it out in an email blast, supporting it on social media. Uh, do you want to put videos of it up? Here's a, a video that we did for the National Corn Growers Association recently when they had uh, three-time gold medal Olympian Jackie Joyner Kersey on as a guest. And that was by far one of the coolest episodes uh, we've done for them. Um, then, of course, uh, uh, being able to follow along and see how well your podcast performs. There's a whole suite of metrics reporting tools that are available if you know where to look so that you can see where people are listening from. You can see how long they're listening. You can see how many episodes an individual person listens to. There's a whole lot of different stuff, but the uh, distribution process there is important. Uh, these are just some uh, additional considerations that I'm going to kind of breeze through here, but if you want to learn more about those, um, you can reach out to me directly. Um, and uh, people ask me, so how do I make a podcast for my brand? Um, my advice is obviously a little bit biased as someone who makes his living uh, producing podcasts for brands. Hire a professional is my first line of advice. But uh, if that's not what you're feeling or if that's not in your budget, uh, there are a few things you absolutely positively must include in your strategy. The first thing, and again, you can do it for very, very cheap and still sound professional. So if not the money, invest the time in sounding professional. But the one thing that you cannot skimp on is you have to have at least a decent microphone and you have to use it properly. So uh, my favorite is the Samson Q2U. It, run, it retails for about $65, $75. It's a USB microphone that you can plug directly into your computer, and it sounds almost as good as a broadcast quality microphone like this Shure SM7B that I'm speaking into right now. But the key to sounding good on any microphone is to use it properly. And when you're using a broadcast microphone properly, I don't know if you guys can see me or not, but you need to be right up on the microphone because if the microphone is more than a few inches away from your face, this is how it sounds. And there's an echo and you can't really hear the person and it's terrible. So please, please use your microphones properly. I beg of you. The second thing that you need is a clean, quiet space in which to record. This doesn't have to be a professional sound studio. What you see here is a picture of my good friend Eric Plantenberg a long time ago when we were working on a movie together and we had to re-record some of his dialogue. And so I built a sound studio in the closet of my apartment in Madison by nailing blankets to the wall. But you need a nice dead space where there's not a lot of echo. Uh, where sound waves aren't reflecting off of things and where preferably there's not a lot of bleed through of other noise from other rooms nearby. Also, any room tone, if there's a, a refrigerator or an air conditioner running in the background, that's going to ruin your audio as well. Um, in this day and age, you need a virtual recording platform. Fortunately, thanks to COVID, we're all experts now in virtual recording platforms. You can do a lot with Zoom or Google Meeting or GoToMeeting, but there are better solutions out there. You have to pay a little bit, but again, something like Squadcast or StreamYard is going to allow you to capture clean audio of every participant, and that gives you a lot more to work with in editing, which is the next thing you absolutely positively must have. Uh, editing software, uh, if you have a, a subscription to Adobe Suite, you already have access to one of the best audio editing tools in the world, Adobe Audition, and you may not even know it. But if you use Photoshop, you're probably already paying for Adobe Audition, so it's available to you. If not, there's a free program called Audacity that is pretty good and you can do a lot with as a beginner. Um, but basic audio editing is an absolute must-have um, because again, I was listening to a podcast that somebody recommended to me once. Um, and, uh, and in the middle of it, uh, there was a power outage and in the middle of this podcast, like content that I wanted to be consuming, these guys were farting around with their equipment, trying to get it to start working again for 10 minutes. And that was 10 minutes of my time that they, uh, that they wasted, um, when they could have spent 30 seconds editing that out. And I've never been back to that podcast. People, people won't stand for it. You have to have editing. And then finally, you need to have uh, an option to host this and make it available to people. Uh, there are a lot of free options, again, if you're doing it on the cheap, SoundCloud, Buzzsprout, Anchor, very good. There are some very cheap and easy options as well, uh, Transistor, Podbean, Simplecast, Blueberry, 
uh, several dozen others. And then of course there are the industry standards. Uh, I'm a big proponent and user of Megaphone because it's got the greatest number of tools and metrics tracking abilities for me. Uh, Libsyn is another one. Those are on the more expensive side, but still not all that pricey at the end of the day. So those, those are the five absolute must haves if you want to produce your own podcast in house. And with that, I have gone over my time, but hopefully we still have a little bit of time left over for Q&A. So Brandon, thank you. Thank you to the Fitchburg Chamber for having me as well. It has been a pleasure. Absolutely. It was, I mean, I, we, we talked previous about podcasts and I mean, I listened to some podcasts myself, um, working in the office by myself. Uh, so it was, it was great to learn a little bit more about how, what, you know, what goes behind the scenes and all that kind of stuff too. So um, you must have been very thorough because I don't see any questions as of right now. Um, but if anybody it's has either any very good or very bad. Well, <laughs> I think it was very good. I mean, you're very, like I said, I listened to you, before, we talked about your presentation before, um, but you're very thorough and very knowledgeable on the topic. So uh, oh, thank, you. thank you very much for um, being with us today. Um, well, just so you guys know, uh, Dusty's email is at the bottom of the screen here for you guys. So if you guys have any additional questions, please feel free to follow up with him. Personally, um, if you forget, uh, feel free to shoot me an email and I am happy to connect you as well. Uh, if, since there are no questions, I believe that will be all that we have for today. So thank you, Dusty. Really appreciate you uh, joining us for our marketing mission. Thank you again very much for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure. We'll talk to you Absolutely. guys again soon. Yep. Thanks, Dusty. Thanks, everyone.